Welcome to the Keen on Yoga podcast, bringing you the stories of many people who in various ways are attempting to walk the path of yoga. Our intention is to inspire your own practice and commitment to yoga beyond the mat and in all areas of life. We consider this an offering, a service to the community and labour of love. If you feel inclined, any donations are appreciated, just visit our page and click the donate button at www.keenonyoga.co.uk forward slash podcast. I hope you enjoy the show. Today's guest on the Keenon Yoga podcast is Matthew Sweeney. Matthew began studying in his youth martial arts, which included different styles over a 14-year period, accumulating in two black belts and one brown belt. As a teenager, he was introduced to yoga by his martial arts teacher. He began to explore explore at that time Iyengar yoga and Ashtanga yoga and was somewhat torn between deciding to do an Iyengar teacher training course in Pune or go to Mysore to study with Patabi Joyce. He ended up choosing the latter and in 1994 went to Mysore for the first time. He returned the following three years to study for six months each time and continued returning until 2006. He began his teaching career in 1996 and continued up into the present day, more recently being famed for a more holistic approach with the moon sequence. He is the author of the very well acclaimed Ashtanga Yoga As It Is, a picture of the primary, intermediate and advanced series. He is a keen inquirer into self-therapy, gestalt and other forms of psychotherapy and has more recently moved to Bali to open a new yoga centre there. Welcome, Matthew, to the Keenan Yoga podcast. Hello. Hi. Can you just tell us a bit about your background? Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Geez, yeah, funny, like, okay. So, they, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know why I'm laughing. It's just, it's just, uh, there's a couple of ways I can tell this story, but I'll, I'll do a short, the short version, which is, I was kind of introduced to yoga through martial arts. So in yeah. my late, mid-teens, late teens, 15, 16, I was really into martial arts. That was my kind of favourite thing to do pretty much. Um, and through, I was pestering my martial arts teacher, to, you know, because I wanted to be more flexible. And the, the joke I tell people is what, what got me into martial arts and the answer was it's either Star Wars or Bruce Lee. What got, sorry, what got me into yoga was either, sorry, I ruined the punchline. What, what, what got me into yoga was uh, either, depending how you take it, Star Wars or, or Bruce Lee. Essentially, it was because I wanted to be able to kick like Bruce Lee. I wanted to be more flexible. So he, yeah. he sent me off. There's a place where I was at that time growing up um, in, in Australia, um, it was a Sachananda ashram. And so there was a teacher who was from there. She wasn't actually in the ashram. She was teaching outside of it. And so I would go to her class like once a week. And so I learned, I started learning such an under yoga, which is funny because at, you know, 16 years of age, the philosophy was very, you know, I didn't want to know. I didn't care. I just wanted to do some stretching, you know. And yeah, I didn't mind yeah. the stretching classes and the doing, you know, shoulder stand, headstand, all of that. I quite like that. Um, but, yeah, the philosophy stuff, you could forget about it as far as I was concerned. But then years later, you know, 15 years, 20 years, you know, it takes a while. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I recall some of that stuff, this teacher Eve, that she used to teach, and I'm like, wow, I'm really into that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny how it changed, you know. How, how did you find your way from the Satyananda Ashram then to Ashtanga and then to Mysore? Well, because at that time I was living at home. So then when I left home, mm. um, I was 17, I uh, went to university and then I was, again, doing martial arts. I moved to Sydney. So I moved, I moved where I was, which was the central coast in Australia, moved away from there, went to Sydney uh, and then started um, going to university and I was, started up martial arts classes again, different martial arts. And then through that eventually got into firstly a thing called hockey yoga and did a teacher training in that. And then through that, I uh, found a teacher who was teaching both Iyengar yoga and Ashtanga yoga. And so at that time, this was like, like I started doing yoga in like 86. And then oh, what year was that? Uh, when did I go to? Oh, yeah, it would have been about 1990. I started yeah. doing uh, shiatsu and oki yoga. I think it was about 1990. And then I was doing shiatsu and oki yoga 
And then in 91, 92, that's when I started doing a show. Oh, wow. And it was, so you were pretty young, right? Like 20 something, early. 20, I was 21, 20, 21, 22 yeah. when I started doing Ashtanga. So I was, I was about 16 when I started doing Satyananda and around 21 when I started doing Ashtanga. And then I think you must have gone to Mysore pretty shortly after because I've seen a video of you. Yeah. You can't be that much older than that doing like a, a primary series or something on Chimundi Hill. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, yeah. In yeah. these bright red <laughs> shorts. I know, yeah, I know the one you're talking yeah. about. Yes. I had those special velvet, special velvet bright red shorts, like the things you do. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I was 23, I think, or 24 when I was first in Mysore. Wow. And then you went for so, a number of months at a time, right? You used to. Yeah, well, I went like three years. I went like three years in a row and went like five or six months each time. Back at the time when you could do that. Uh, yeah. yeah, and that was and, oh, well. You know, then, back in the time when I was willing to go on credit card debt. <laughs> what was your experience? I mean, you were in Lakshmi Forum. What was your experience of it then? I mean, obviously, you liked it to go back for a second time. It was great. You know, I had a like, I had a great relationship with Patabi Joyce, which you know, like now, given history with w- what's happened with him and my opinions on. Mm what he was doing badly, uh, maybe if you want, we can come back to that. But, but my first introduction, he was very nice to me. Like I, I arrived, I had a, in those days, I mean, the internet existed, but I didn't really know about it. I wasn't very clued in with those things. So I arrived, I didn't even have a mobile phone. So I arrived with a handwritten uh, address, which I gave the, uh, coming out of the train station of Mysore, I gave the yeah. rickshaw driver the address. He's looking and he goes, and I'm trying to say Lakshmi Puram in my bad Australian yeah. accent, and he he doesn't understand. So he reads it and goes, "Oh, oh Lakshmi Puram, Lakshmi Puram," okay. <laughs> and off he goes. And so I arrived, and Patabi Joyce was sta- happened to be standing at his door. Yeah. And so yeah. he met me, and he was just like, "Oh yeah, yeah." And I said, and he, just, he said, "Do you have somewhere to stay?" I said, "No, I I'm, I don't know. I'm going to find something." I was yeah. you know, one of those <laughs> disorganized yeah. travelers. I was probably used to those kind he, of people. Yeah. Yeah, and he found yeah. me. Uh, he because he knew that students were staying in the Carvery Lodge, this place nearby. Yeah, and so he yeah. he he, helped, he told the rickshaw where to go. He got me that place. He said, "Come back in the afternoon, pay him the money." And you know, very nice, very helpful. So I had a very good, very mm. good first introduction with him, and so then just started practicing uh, that next day and loved it. You know, but I, I mean, I'd be doing Ashtanga for a couple of years by then. I was like, twenty four, I think, when I was first there. About 24, 23, something like that. And so I'd already been doing Ashtanga for a couple of years. Um, uh-huh. But, you know, very young, very, very yeah, motivated. Yeah. And so just love the sweaty, jumping kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, and you said you had a good relationship with him. I mean, in what way was that? Just that he was very friendly to you and, you know, not too yeah, brutal and just, and just in you? <laughs> yeah, just, I don't know. Like he, I mean, the first year I was there he didn't know my name but the second year he did so that was always a, a turning point when he would say yes you man Ma- uh, Matthew you know like instead of just hey hey you or you man or good man or bad man or you know the, the usual stuff that he said so he started to remember my name but then you know I went I went there for that period of those first few years and then I had a couple of different periods where I was going there and then some years later I came back and he was older and he'd forgotten my name again. So, you know, that happened. He remembered, he remembered me but he just didn't know my name. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that was very common with him. I mean, I wasn't that, not, not compared to some, I wasn't that close to Batavi Joyce. Um, but, you know, as I say, he was always nice to me. It was just, you know, there were other... Mm, as you will very well know, like there were other mm. issues going on there at the time, which, you know, ongoing that, you know, in retrospect, you know, were, yeah, you know, problematic and, you know, very bad what, what happened. You were, but, you, were, you were aware of them at the time, were you? Of course, everyone was. Anyone who says that they weren't is, frankly, they're lying. Interesting. So it was... It was there, con- there's, absolutely, there's absolutely no way. I mean, I, I assume you've seen right. the... the uh, interview with, oh, see, with, Marty yeah, yeah. with Marty as Radi. And what she's saying is perfect because I, I love Marty. Because yeah. she, mm. she, was, she would call a spade a spade and, I, you know, I'm, I'm very much in that same sort of camp. I'm maybe mm. not as, well, I can be as blunt as Marty was. But, Marty, you know, I, I mean, Marty was I, pretty, she was pretty blunt, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I totally agree. Like any, any senior Ashtanga teacher who has not, A, come out and apologised 
and B, admitted to the fact that they knew it was wrong and, and continued going anyway is, is complicit with the crime. It's an accessory, so, uh, you know, yeah. you're... Yeah, right. So it's a bit, I mean, it's a bit early on in the podcast to go into this, but we may as well now. I mean, yeah. I always try and let it unfold yeah. organically. Um, well, so, I mean, how do you justify it to yourself then? For me, as a combination of things, when you're, it's, it's the problem with what we would call group ideology or community dynamics. And it happens with any community, with, it, with any system. I mean, you can have the same thing with certain scientists. I mean, the difference with science is they're, they're trying to follow observ- observable phenomena and be as exacting about that. But, you know, there's been times in history where all of these things, whether it's politics or any group function where when the, you know, it's like when uh, the debate in scientific community, a couple of, I don't forget when now, I have to look up the dates, you know, a couple hundred years ago when, when medicine was progressing to the point where a few scientists were saying, I think there's these thing called germs. And a lot of scientists said that's bullshit, it's, it's hocus pocus, it's nonsense, you're talking about magic, it's, it's, it's ridiculous, it's not scientific. And in fact, the people talking about germs, well, it's actually very scientific and they're quite right. You need to wash your hands before you operate, blah, 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 blah. So, but stuff at that time that was considered a little bit hocus pocus. And so when you're in a community that develops a belief system, then anyone who's challenging that belief system is often, you know, pushed out or or Mm. a whole Mm. lot of aggressive behaviour can happen. So, you know... I mean, a lot of communities, there's a whole lot of different ways that, that, that this occurs anyway. So it's not, it's not a justification, but it's just an, an awareness of the fact that at that time, I mm-hmm. didn't personally believe that Patabi Joyce was being sexually abusive. Mm. Right. Now, that, that, that belief was wrong. I, and I'm, I've admitted publicly that I was wrong. I was and wrong I, to not yeah. understand that. And, and there so, were others but it's at the just, time that claimed that. There were others at, the t- at that time around you saying that and, and you were kind of, well, you know, you were just kind of burying your head in the sand. Well, well, because the majority of the, the more experienced teachers were saying either it's just an Indian thing or it's a Patabi Joyce thing or he's not, he's not being wrong, it's just he's the guru, you can't criticise, and a whole lot of defensive behaviour that was, that was wrong. Like, and and it, all of us who chose to turn a blind eye for it, were, were, we were not standing up for good ethical behaviour. It's not, there's no, there's no, to me, there's no grey area in that. You, you, you either confess to the fact that you realised what was happening was wrong and you just were choosing to turn a blind eye. Because, I mean, the problem is if you, I mean, I was there when, you know, a, a couple of different situations where Patabi Joyce was confronted, he became embarrassed, uh, you know, a whole lot of ramifications happened around that. And the fact that he was embarrassed tells us something very quickly, which is he knew it was wrong. If he, if he, if he had had no reaction and not done anything about it, then it's very clear that you could, have, you could have made an argument for the fact that, well, he's just having close adjustments. But the fact is he knew he shouldn't have been touching women the way he was. It's sexually abusive. It's not, there's no, there's no grey area in that. And so he shouldn't have been doing it. And so... You know, okay. Mm. So uh, the, the problem, though, is that for a lot of us, maybe not on my first trip, but by my third trip, fourth trip, fifth trip, you know, my, because by that point I'm starting to teach Ashtanga yoga, right? I mean, I was young, mm-hmm. but it doesn't matter. So my livelihood is dependent yeah, on not only, it. yeah, 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 it's not only dependent on Patabi Joyce's approval, it's also dependent on the community's approval. So it's, mm. it's a very hazy kind yeah. of business, but. And so I, I have to be, at that point, you, you have to choose to be careful about what you say and do in order to remain within the community's approval. Now, this is mm. still true today, even though there's not so much unethical, well, there are some within the Ashtanga or other yoga communities. It's the same problem occurs. If the community closes, if there's not open discussion and, and a, you know, an ability to have argument and discourse and disagreement, then the community will inevitably suffer because there's going to be, you know, abuses consciously or unconsciously. It's not that everyone's setting out to be abusive. Like, sure, Shirat, Shirat's a good guy overall, but he, you know, there's a number of issues where you can't challenge Sharat and say, 
well, I don't think this is right. If you do that, you'll be kicked out of the group. Mm. And so you, you have to choose either to shut your mouth even if you don't disagree or you choose to agree with some very unethical behaviour, you know, which is pretty bad. You know, so you, you, I, so I, I'm quite sympathetic to, to anyone who was there at the time who, you know, you, particularly a lot of the men who was like, well, he doesn't adjust me like that. So, and if none of the women are complaining, well, it's none of my business. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've heard that you know, before. That's not that's not a valid yeah. response. It's it's just an understandable. I mean, not valid. It's, yeah, it's it's not the best response, but it's it's okay. It's a it's a reasonable thing to go. Look, I, okay, I know it was wrong, but I, I, you know, it's, it's the best I could do at the mm, time. Mm, mm. Um, yeah, luckily I I have I'm able to avoid that issue because by the time I came to Pitabi, she was so old. Um, he could barely yeah. stand up anymore, so he could just about count right. the class. So uh, he had right. no capacity to, to do any fiddling. Um, so right. I didn't have to <laughs> right. to myself, fortunately. Uh, um, so what were, the, what were the benefits of um, practicing there at the time? I mean, it must have been some benefit to you, and, and, and you know, hindsight, oh, well, you know. Um, I mean, I think I think the benefits, the main benefits, are the same as anyone practicing now. It's just you know, people who like the self practice, the continuity of moving with your breath you know, the dynamic of it, the strength element in it. You know, there's a whole lot of things that I think it's, it's fairly common for anyone doing that kind of practice. And so you know, the only other, other extra benefit I might say was that when I was first there, you know, we had a lot less people to deal with. And so I got more attention than, say, a room full of 50, 60 people. I mean, right. not that you always wanted, not that you always wanted the attention. I mean, <laughs> half what, the time what, I didn't want what, it to. What were the adjustments like? Often they were good. Occasionally they weren't. <laughs> and you must have progressed pretty quickly, right? Because you came, you know, pretty young. And then by the end of it, you produced that book, which, I um, mean, you know, there are other reasons to be out of the camp apart from your moon sequence. I think it started with the, yeah. the book probably, didn't it? They, they would have yeah. picked you out for that. Um, so, I mean, you progressed well, through those sequences with, with Patabi Joyce. Yes. I mean, I, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to have had, I was already fairly strong and flexible, reasonably healthy by the time I came to doing Ashtanga yoga. And I had the grace of genetics, which gave me certain ability to be both strong and flexible with certain things. I mean, a lot of that, I don't, I don't always subscribe to the fact that it's not just about hard work and effort. A lot of it's genetics. I agree. You know, how much? How, how much is argumentative, but, you know, a significant mm-hmm. amount is just that's what you're born with. And so I was yeah. just lucky that I, I had a good capacity for it. And so my progression, I mean, at the time it felt like it was hard work and, you know, it could be struggle and injuries and blah, blah, blah. But when I look back and I compare it to a lot of students that I've taught, my my general I, process yeah. was I think, probably I smoother yeah. than most people. Well, you made good headway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you still do that stuff? I mean, uh, some of it. So, sooner or later that changes because, you know, as you get older, like yeah, hopefully yeah. hopefully we get a little more mature, but also, you know, the body, you're going to be less capable of certain things. And so you, you, you look at, you know, what suits, what doesn't suit and how much of that is, you know, laziness and how much of it is me just not willing to hurt myself. Hmm. And so you Did just, you, get, you know, it's just a matter of weighing up weighing up those things and being as practical as possible. So you got injuries during the, the process of, of getting, I mean, you finished the advanced B on your own, right? And you did the advanced yeah. A, I think, with, with Batabi Joyce. Um, yes. Yeah, I, and, and, yeah, and I finished, and yeah, I finished advanced A, did the first couple of postures of advanced B with them, um, but never, never further than that. Um, and then, yeah, learnt advanced B with some other teachers and on my own. And, and some of advanced C because I, I used to watch, you know, I used to practice next I, to Sharat when he was learning it. So. I, like, I heard that before. Yeah, I like that one. So you're just yeah. kind of cribbing it, you know, kind of looking to the side and seeing what he was doing. And yeah, you know, oh, well, I, I have very good, have a go I have very good focus, but yeah. Yeah. I have very good focus. But yeah, I was quite aware of him practicing next to me, you know. Try it wasn't, it wasn't every day. The arms turned, yeah. it, it wasn't every day, but it was enough to, to notice yeah. a few things. Right. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's exactly where I got to. I think I got to the second posture of the advanced B. And, and I think that's, you know, I mean, for a lot of people, you kind of hope you get to a certain stage and then you start to, this focus 
also kind of shifts and, and grows as you get older. Otherwise, you, you know, you're increasingly yeah. going to, you know, I mean, when you say, okay, you know, you learned it when you were very young, right? And you didn't, I mean, yeah. you, you mentioned you were kind of, you had some, some injuries. Yeah, well, uh, uh, I guess a couple of them I would attribute to also pre-existing conditions, but the, the, some of it, like, for example, I, I had a knee injury, but the actual injury occurred while I was playing, mucking around at the beach. And I just, I just sat down funny and my meniscus tore and I, I felt it go. But at that time, I'd been practising advanced V and I'd been putting my knee under and my hip under, hips under, you know, a fair amount of strain. And so the injury, I doubt, I really doubt the injury would have occurred if I hadn't mm-hmm. been doing the kind of yoga that I'd been doing. And so, you know, I know, although I could say the injury didn't occur while I was practising, but it, it didn't really matter. The fact was, you know, and, and since then I, I, you know, slowly pulled away from doing certain passes and certain sequences because I just found them, the sequencing stopped making sense. Mm. So, you just, so you've let that injury, I mean, you've healed that injury or you, you had a uh, operation or? Yeah, I had a, I had an arthroscopy, a meniscus yeah, yeah. operation. So Mm-mm. I wouldn't say I'm healed from it, but I'm certainly significantly better than it was, where, you know, in the midst of the injury. So I can do lotus and a lot of postures that, mm-hmm. you know, if, if, if the knee was inflamed or, the, you know, meniscus was still flapping mm-hmm. around, I, I wouldn't be able to do them. So I just had a very good recovery. And, and I guess also I had the operation fairly young and my body was still fairly you know, strong and healthy. So yeah, the operation for me was a, was a success, but you know, not everyone has the same, whatever it's, it's, it's a, I think it's a case by case thing. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I've also had that, um, <laughs> meniscus. I had it in India. Yeah. In fact. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, he was on the, yeah. he's on the mobile phone when he's operating on the leg. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's under local, local right. anesthetic. Yeah. It was, it was kind of, um, well, it was quite a high uh, um, on anaesthetic, so it was kind of funny. Um, yeah, <laughs> and right. I recovered fine, so I'm not necessarily anti the operation, but um, you know, um, yeah, as you say, I think it is a case by case. Um, so, yeah. and you mentioned you you're not doing the traditional practice anymore. Is there any benefit of tradition, or at some point, once learning a certain sequence, when should we branch off? I mean, yeah, I throw that over to you. Okay, I mean. Mm. I do occasionally still practice primary or intermediate. It's not often. I usually do my own versions of those sequences. Um, There's a few different ways I can go with this discussion. I think it's a good one. Um, Essentially, yes, I think the tradition, there's a lot of value. Like there's two or three main things that Ashtanga has that no other system comes close to. And... It's kind of sad that they don't. It's understandable, perhaps, but it's sad. The, the biggest one and the main one is is self practice. To me, to me, that's not about what sequence. It doesn't matter the sequence, and it doesn't matter if you follow it exactly or do half of it or do your own version. Self practice is, without a doubt, and particularly coming into a classroom self practice where the teacher can be there to look at you and assist you and blah 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 blah. Now, if you take that to the extreme that Meister style can go. It doesn't always, but it can go in the extreme of it's like being in boot camp. You're in, you're a military, you know, you're a, I don't know what the, what the rankings are in the military, but you know, you're, you're the lowest of the low when you enter a class and the teacher is the general. And if you don't follow all the instructions precisely, you're going to get screamed at. And so there's, you know, there's a number of teachers who, well, maybe minus the screaming. I mean, some do literally, but um, and, and they treat it like if you can't follow the sequence exactly, you're going to leave. They're not going to keep teaching you. And so mm. it ends up just being very dogmatic and taking things a little too extremely. So my, my, my main criticism of Ashtanga Yoga isn't really the sequence or self-practice. Well, well actually, let me back up a little. So there's, there's two things I was going to say. So one was self-practice is one of the big things. The other thing that Ashtanga has that no other system some are, some are getting there, but none of them are really close, is it, 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 is it attempts to, it doesn't succeed, but it attempts to balance between strength and flexibility. Mm-hmm. And if there's one thing I've seen sort of more injuries in yoga from, it's overdoing, overdoing the flexibility stuff yeah. without doing yeah. enough, and I wouldn't say strength, I would say without doing enough stability work. And there is not enough work in traditional Hatha yoga on stability. To do that, you have to 
look outside of the tradition. And for a lot of people practicing traditional yoga, that's a bitter pill. They don't want to swallow it because it's not traditional. And if you're, if you're wanting to take care of the human physical body, you, you have to include stuff that's not traditional. If you don't, you are not doing a good job. And so that gets me to the point I was going to make about my only real criticism of Ashtanga isn't the sequence, it's, it's more how it can often be taught. It's not that everyone's teaching it this way, it's just that the general push is, and the concept is, it is better to follow the sequence how it is supposed to be than to change the sequence. And mm-hmm. I would say completely the opposite. It is better from the beginning for every person, it could be one posture, it could be half the sequence or it could be the whole sequence, is to look at what is appropriate for that student. It's got to be individual versus group ideology. And if you take that individually, you will no longer hurt people. Even people coming with pre-existing conditions, they're less likely to injure themselves because, you know, some people you don't do half lotus. Other people you don't do so many forward bends. Other people you introduce back bends differently, et cetera, et cetera. And if you're not considering that, you're, you're basically not doing the, a good job as a teacher. And so you could start with a model like the primary series, and that's fine. The model is, is fair enough because it has some really good stuff in it, combination of the breath, the working on the strength, working on your flexibility. And then with that model, for some people, you, you, you go down, you know, you scale down. Some people you scale sideways. You, you've got to look at, well, d- does this person with two hamstring injuries really need to be doing 20 forward bends six days a week? Or, or is, is that just going to make it worse? And if you get rid of all forward bends, what are you going to teach them? And Ashtanga doesn't have a proper answer for that, not at, not at this stage, unless you're willing right. to teach a different sequence. Or, or someone's got two busted meniscus, they still potentially can do yoga, but you can't do a whole lot of stuff that's in the primary series. Mm-hmm. You probably can't teach them intermediate either because it's too damn difficult. So what do, you, what do you teach them? So the problem is you end up teaching to the elite. If you're going to teach Ashtanga mm-hmm. yoga, even, even if you just do one or two small variations, if you're still trying to teach primary as the only thing to teach, because, you know, the first thing you teach someone is salute to the sun jumping. And for probably 90% of the population, that's a nightmare, which means you're catering to 10% of the population, of which only 1% will finish primary. So basically a good Ashtanga teacher, if they're following the tradition, is teaching to the top one percentile, which is sad. It's really sad. How do you push people to kind of circumvent their limitations? The idea, obviously, the counter argument would be by by doing something and by challenge, you kind of overcome that challenge. Well, that's what people would would argue that, against. That you. works if you have a few pre-existing conditions. So, if you're looking at a bell curve, yeah. and we have most men and women exist within the middle of the bell curve. So, if you're if you're saying you need to push certain people, and then they will improve to get better. That's the top 10 percentile. It is not the middle 70 percent. It's actually the top 10 percent who you can push. Oh, not top 10 percent, sorry. Let's say the, it's the, the middle, uh, the bottom 10 percent of the top 20 percent, right? The top 10 right. percentile, they can just keep doing it because they have no significant injuries at the beginning. But the, but the, 10, 20% below that, so you're looking in, if you, if you, you'd have to see this on a graph, right? And the statistics yeah. of this are very, are very clear. I, I mean, I've done, I've done some work on this myself. I, I'd like to see proper studies done. But So if you've got the top 10%, they're, they're yeah. at, in Ashtanga, you only see the top 30% doing Ashtanga anyway. You do not yeah. see the bottom 70% even attempting Ashtanga because it's too hard for them. They won't even go to the class. And if they do, they'll do half the class, walk out, or they'll do the whole, whole class and never come back because it's too hard. So you see top 30%. Of that top 30%, 10% can keep going through with not too bad. The, the next 10% have at least one significant problem. And if you yeah. say keep pushing, they are going to injure themselves, guaranteed. The 10% below that are already injured and it's, you know, you either have to limit them to doing half primary without the difficult stuff and that's it for the rest of their life. That's it. Half primary, rest of your life, you're done. I'm like, well, that sucks. That's, there's no physiological reason for that to help someone. Because you know, the body needs variation. You need to 
you know, mm. it means different things. But what about the idea of the vinyasa? I mean, and again, just picking um, arguments against this position. Not that I don't sub- circumscribe to your position. No, but what okay, about the, argu- a, what about the argument of the vinyasa that you've got the, the placement of the breathing and that somehow affects the stability of the mind or the energy system that you can keep to this patterning and then you, you order other elements within that, then you lose the count and you lose the mind control. Okay, so that, start thinking you've got, anatomically. There's, mm-hmm. Okay, there's two basic approaches here. And, and then that you, when, you, when you're talking of these two approaches, although they're complementary, they are like comparing apples and oranges. Right. And, you, and, and, and it's good to be clear about the distinction. And so one is called yoga chikitsa. People say primary series is yoga chikitsa, but that's not what it means. The other one is called yoga shakti, which is really what primary series and ashtanga and intermediate and advanced, that's what it's all about, yoga shakti, which means follow the sequence, work through the heat, the counting of the breath, and in that process, things open up, you get stronger, you find things start coming together. The problem with that, that is yoga shakti is embedded around group ideology. It's, a, it's a, this an This is yoga shakti. This first one is yoga yes. shakti. Right. Okay. And, I mean, Krishnamacharya, who's the teacher of Patabi Joyce, he was very clear on this. So Yoga Shakti is he a, is it a that pro- to me. Oh yes. Oh right. yes. There's no there's no denying this this conversation. This is I'm okay. not making it up. So uh-huh. right. And so yoga and that's where you would do a group class or, or a self-practice class where people are are required to follow exactly as they can with tapas, you know, with concentration. And so yeah. by 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 doing this, you the body transforms. The the the, the self awareness starts to transform, and that that happens often, as I say, with that top ten percentile. But the ten percentile below that, because what we're doing is you're trying to impose yoga shakti onto someone who has a pre existing physical condition that they they're just going to get they're just going to get more badly, and I don't care what your argument is at that point, if you're not taking care of their physical body first and you start saying, oh, you're not being devotional, you're not being spiritual, you're not right. following mm-hmm. the system, mm-hmm. you're, you're, you're imposing your orange onto the apple. And they're two different, they're complementary, but they're two different systems. Now, right. there are times where, there are times where so one or the other is, is useful. What, yoga Chikita is, where does that come from? Yoga Chikitsa, I mean, it's yoga therapy. Yoga Chikitsa, yeah. and this is Krishnamacharya's, not just Krishnamacharya's teaching, it's anyone's teaching who understands yoga therapy. And it's, there's one basic rule, which is individual, which means any system, sequence, posture has to be changed for that individual if it's not appropriate. Now, assessing whether something's appropriate or not, if you then go, and this is we're talking apples here, if you then go, yeah. no, orange, it means it's spiritual, you've got to be devotional, yeah. and you're imposing that devotional ideal onto a person who's got two blown meniscus, basically you are being unethical. It's, it's not devotional to put your dogma on top of somebody like that. It's, it's incredibly, well, it's horrible. And so we well, have to be careful yeah. about we're currently it becomes religious yoga, versus spiritual. Yeah. Yo, we're currently no. calling the, the primary series yoga yoga shakti when it should be called yoga chikita. No, no, the other no, way around. It, we currently, you're right. <laughs> it right. should be called yoga shakti. <laughs> right. And, it, yeah, and yeah. When, you apply, when you apply the primary series properly, which is there are a number of Ashtanga teachers who are doing this, what you do then is looking at individual students, you go, you know, you, you shouldn't be jumping at all. You need to just start with some basic stability work, work on your right. standing postures, work on some basic strength in the arms and legs. And as that develops, maybe in a year, two years, maybe we can start developing the jumps, but not straight away. Or someone else who's got like a slit disc in the, in the lower back. And I'm like, well, let's watch forward bends here, particularly, I don't, you know, because if you, as soon as they do the first forward bend, they're fucked. They're, they, they won't walk, you know. Yeah. I, I mean, it's a terrible situation. Yeah. On a, on a practical level, I mean, you mentioned earlier about the idea of needing that the yoga, happy yoga, the traditional, doesn't give uh, enough strength building work how do you introduce no. the strength into how do you i mean one one why doesn't it or what's it for then if it's not a physical system right. why you know and secondly how do you introduce the strength into your sequence? okay all right so the first question it's very easy to answer it, it's historical and it's very it's a very simple thing that the traditional reason that we practice hatha yoga is not to be healthy 
and it's certainly not for physical health, right? The traditional reason to practice Hatha yoga is so that you can be more comfortable to sit still in meditation, physically comfortable, and also to, to sit for pranayama. And so it was a, a, a precursor, a stepping stone for pranayama and meditation. And so therefore, if you, and I've done, a, I've done stats on this, I've written out over a thousand postures and when you have a thousand postures gathered together, approximately yeah. 70% of them work on out, outer hip mobility, out, 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 open is, rotation of the hip. Mm, is, is there a kind of so when you have, a reason for this? Uh, people go on to a yeah. whole lot of yeah, yeah, yeah. hocus pocus about energy. I, I don't want to get involved in that. I, I, oh, you've got to say a bit about that. I mean, is there any reason well, to let, opening the Let me come back to it. Let me finish, let me finish first. Idea. So if you, if you, yeah. yeah, let me come back to that. If you've got yeah, 70% yeah, yeah. of most okay. postures have yeah. some element of outer hip rotation, it means that that's what one of our goals is, is to open the hip so we can be comfortable sitting. Right. Whereas you've got like... Of those, say less than maybe 10% were for opening up the shoulders and upper back. I mean, that's horribly imbalanced. If you have 70% open hips in a particular direction and 10% on opening shoulders and upper back, well, structurally you've, got, you've, you've set up with an imbalance. And this is within Hatha Yoga. It's a fact. It's not a, this is not a, you can, if anyone else can do the statistics, you can run through all the postures, you know, yeah, it's very simple. Right. Mm-hmm. So then what you need to look at is, well, for a lot of people who have tight shoulders and tight upper back, well, I may want to do a little less on the hips and a little more on the shoulders to try and balance that out. I mean, this is just an example. There's lots of different examples of this. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, do think, I do think Ashtanga makes an attempt towards balancing some of that. It just, it misses a few key points, just basic structure. And so, and, and most, and Ashtanga is not the only one, most Hatha yoga systems are the same in this. I've been to a lot of different Hatha yoga, Iyengar classes, blah, 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 and there aren't that many that really work on certain areas of the body. And so, it, I mean, it's just, it's just simply because Hatha yoga wasn't, I mean, it, it, it does help you with your physical health. There's no doubt about that. But it's not the primary goal. The primary goal is to be comfortable to sit. And now... It, if you change that, then you've got to go, well, how can I add some stuff to the shoulders? How can I look at some strengthening or stability work? And so then it's a matter of just a little bit of homework. So you can do a combination of a few things within the practice. So there are various ways to add them to certain sequencing okay. and also yeah. to do, and also to just do half an hour of prep work before you practice, which is based around stability and strength. Like so, you know, well, core strength, side body, uh, arm stability, depends what the issue is. Like some people have uh, very, you know, n- not a very strong abdomen. So you may, may work on that. Others, it may not be the abdomen. It might be QL. You know, they may have a weak, weak lower back. Mm. I mean, people complain about, you know, sore lower back and it's like actually 80 to 90% of the time it's because you, you're weak there. It's not just because you've got bad core or something. You know, people, everyone says core strength, core strength. It becomes a big catchphrase. Mm. Uh, but mm. Um, 80, 90% may be a bit high, but it's a significant amount of people who have just a weak lower back from, from doing too many flexibility postures. So, you know, start strengthening your back, you know. It, it, and there's ways to do it. I mean, for some people, uh, and it may be horrifying for some people to hear, it may mean going to the gym a couple of times a week. Yeah. But getting a, getting a personal yeah. trainer. Right, Absolutely, okay. getting a personal trainer, so, and it, particularly someone who's quite strong and and uh, sorry, uh, quite flexible and not very strong. So, just kind of trying to kind of um, lead you gently back into the the uh, the issue of the Kundalini aspect of it. You're approaching the right. practice purely on a physical um, kind of uh, anatomical no, level here. No, I, I, I would say if you're if we start with the idea that I'm teaching asana. So I don't even like the word for a lot of us, uh, yoga teacher. Now, I will call myself a yoga teacher. I think that's fair enough. But, but where I start, my, the entry point I have for most people is asana. And if we're starting with asana, the first thing we have to take care of is the physical body. What comes along with that is trying to be considerate and kind when it comes to other minds and other egos. And so dealing with other human beings, we have to work on our communication and ethics a little bit so that I can be considerate of someone else so that 
we can meet halfway in the middle versus, mm. you know, I don't know, either person being disrespectful. So, so but where we, where we start is the physical body. Now, that's not where we end up. I mean, what comes along with that, as I say, there's the mind thing, but then there's also a whole lot of, let's call it energy work or awareness work. There's various layers to that that I think runs along with the yoga practice right from the beginning. So it's important to introduce that from the beginning as well, but it's not the first ethical starting point. The first ethical starting point for teaching asana is uh, cause no harm. Mm -hmm. The second one is I am not going to restrict the freedom of another human being. So I'm not going to try and control you. And if a teacher's not making those two statements very clearly, you're going to be a problem. Not maybe, you will be a problem. So those are the two things. You've got to start by, I do not want to cause this body any further harm than it's already in. Because bodies come with pre-existing injuries. So as a minimum... as a teacher, aren't you you restricting freedom? I mean, obviously, you having done it for 20, 30 years uh, are in a position of, of experience and potentially, you know, hopefully, you know a bit more than the way that they know how to move. So then... Okay, so yes, yes, but you've got to be very careful about how you go Mm. about that. And so, Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a couple of... Look, this is a very big discussion. There's a couple of important things that I would say. One is how psychologically you deal with other people. And so one is what I call horizontalization. It's an expression in psychotherapy. And so horizontalization is where I do not make myself more important than you because I'm not. I'm another human being, you're another human being. And if I'm not treating you with the utmost respect, we end up with a a hierarchy. If I'm the teacher and I'm always the expert, I'm going to get it wrong. So this this is a key understanding. The, the, the student is the expert on their experience. The student, therefore, is the expert on their body. I am not. I am the expert on my understanding of the system, but that's external to the student. And if I impose that external model on top of the student, I'm doing them harm automatically. What I have to do is say to the student, here are the structures I want you to work with for now because, you know, it's the first day of the first time you've ever done yoga. So you have to, you know, if I say left foot forward, try and put your left foot forward. If I say put your finger on your nose, you try and put your finger on your nose. You know, those are basic instructions. So Mm -hmm. the student has to try and follow those essential basic rules because otherwise you won't learn. So you have to try and follow the instructions. Having said that, the student has the right to say no and the student has the right to argue and say, I don't like that. I don't like what you did. And if you don't allow for that, you, you're basically stuck in dogma. You're stuck in forcing a system on top of the student and squashing their individuality. It's, it's mm-hmm. religious, not spiritual, and it's disgusting. Mm-hmm. But the, the problem is <laughs> most, people, most people don't even recognise that that's what's going on in the first place simply because that's what you've learned, that's what you know. If all you know is this is the system, that's the primary series, not even primary. I mean, just look at Iyengar yoga. You know, oh, that's Iyengar yoga. If you break the rules, you can only teach those six postures. If you yeah. teach anything else, you're going to get kicked out. I mean, that's horrible. That's no, that's no way mm, to live. Mm. Now, not, not to say there shouldn't be some guidelines. We need some boundaries. And that's where, okay, let's say you use the primary series as a model. You have some boundaries around... When someone starts, you go, okay, here we're going to begin with this and this. Here's the breathing. Uh, here's where you focus on your drishti, blah, 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 blah. And so you have some foundation principles that you would teach the student mm-hmm. and they do their best to follow them. Now, th- there's, there's two parts to that. One is the student tries their best and, and either because you're noticing or because they're saying, they're saying, oh, that hurts. Now, if it's just the first day, you say, yeah, I know it's a bit uncomfortable, but it looks like you're doing fine. <laughs> you're, well, because you don't know. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so yeah. The, the point that I, I, I wonder, I don't know, but I wonder with a lot of teachers is they too often, let me back up a little, one of the fundamentals when it comes to teaching yoga, do you, you teach yoga, I assume? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I do. So no. you, I, I ask you this question and I, I don't know what your answer is going to be. I'm hoping for, for an answer, but I, I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> All right. Every time before you start teaching a class, 
Yeah. Particularly if there's a bunch of new students, would you say generally you're a little bit nervous? Yeah, I am. Yeah. You say that's you say that's fairly common. I don't know. <laughs> I can't tell about anyone else. I mean, I think you're teaching a lot of different people with different expectations and different levels. Um, and you know, it's a, it's a it's a uncontrolled and should be an uncontrolled experience, and you don't know what's going to happen. Right. Essentially. Right. So, right. Yeah. So, to me, that's the first truth that you have to come to terms with. And so, there's a, a couple of different ways people deal with that anxiety. Because when you're confronted with dealing with different people who may like you or dislike you. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. You either face the level of conflict that 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 involves and don't and and just to believe that teaching yoga doesn't involve conflict, you're you're fooling yourself. It's conflict. You whether it's your own internal conflict or literal conflict with, you know, fractious personalities, mm. facing your own internal conflict means dealing with the anxiety. And if you deal with it by trying to control that, control yourself and therefore control the class, you're not paying attention and you certainly won't open mm. your heart. Whereas if you deal with that by going, oh, I do feel anxiety, well, that's the same as the student because the student's confronted by, shit, this teacher's asking me to do all this shit and I don't know how and, and it hurts and I'm not mm. sure. And when you reflect on your own anxiety, it's the same as the student's anxiety this is what we call horizontalization. It's the same well, thing. I mean, just playing, you know, obviously I'm in the role to play devil's advocate. I mean, playing yeah. devil's advocate here though, don't you, I mean, don't you think you want to offer a kind of stable, kind of um, strong kind of uh, model for the student to um, take some courage in? You don't want to be some, you know, yes. weak, anxious, you know, you know how is no. that going to inspire a student no, to, to overcome absolutely. their own worries? Okay. You know? <laughs> how, how do you truly deal with anxiety? Yeah, is it by yeah. c controlling it or is it by opening up to it so far that it doesn't throw you off your horse when it surprises you? And it's only the second one that works. If you try and control it by presenting a front, which is a fiction, it's a false personality that you, and this is what a lot of teachers get into unconsciously, is we start presenting, hello, I am Matthew Sweeney, the yoga teacher. And now I'm giving you my very ultra spiritual yoga teacher voice. And when you hear that, you feel like you're already ascending to the <laughs> height. Of your you know, I can keep going like this for hours and hours. Now, if I, well, if they, I they also like take that, on an English persona when they when they do that. Oh, right. <laughs> does, it, does it sound English? Does it sound English to you? Yeah, yes, it I mean, is. I can't, I, can't do an, I can't do an American accent, so yeah, you know, yeah. it would be the same in any culture. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, if we start yeah. adopting that yoga teacher yeah. persona, which, yeah, is, yeah. which is dualistic to what actually is really going on, which is actually a whole lot of people, teachers are terrified of their students half the time, terrified. And the only way to deal with that is to walk through it, which means starting to own up to how, and it's not that you want to break down in the front of your class because that's a very poor, Ooh. very poor professional standard. What, what, <laughs> what, what you do is able to own your anxiety enough that when someone starts confronting you, your first response isn't, no, you're wrong, don't you disagree with me, you shut up, uh, you slap them, <laughs> you put them <laughs> down. You, well, uh, yeah, yeah, any, number yeah, yeah. Of, any number of bad behaviour, yeah. which yeah. But was what, what we do is we try and self-reflect. Um, this is the way it's done in my school. Right. Right, and you, you pass it off, no, this is traditional, shut up yes, and just is, yeah, put your yeah, head down. Yeah. And it's like, well, hang on. Now, there are times where that's appropriate, but it's a conversation where you say, look, right now I don't want to be having this conversation. I prefer you just put your head down, do your practice, and at the end of class then we can have this discussion and I'll give you plenty of time so we can try and sort this out. And then great, then we've got an appropriate timing for, because in the middle of class someone's, you know, complaining mm. or making a mess or doing, you know, doing things they shouldn't. Say, hey, why are you doing handstand when I'm teaching headstand? Stop it. Everyone's doing headstand. You do headstand. You know, so you, occasionally you'll tell someone off. That's okay, but but that that doesn't mean you're not doing it without respect. And it, and then later on, the student says, "I don't like how you spoke to me." Oh, was I being rude? You know, and then you can have a conversation. Oh, I'm really sorry. I I didn't mean. I, I'm sorry if I seem to be rude. I didn't mean it that way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, can we talk about this? You know, how can I? Blah blah blah. And so, a certain amount of consideration. But if a teacher isn't 
It's something I was doing with my teacher training group recently. But there's there's a couple of basic conditions. I, we t- I was talking to a, I was talking to a couple of people about like enlightenment, and it's such a a thing that people either aspire to or they put it in the too hard basket, or it's just such a it's like a. And so for me, there's there's only really two conditions that that you, you need to consider for enlightenment. Number one is the two main qualities that I see coming out of anyone who's, whether they're enlightened or just waking up, let's say, there's only really right. two conditions. One is one is kind of a, a kind of a, a function around awareness or observation that they're able to hold space. They're able to see someone else in conflict and not be too reactive to it. They're able to even see their own conflict and not be too reactive to it. As soon as you get controlling or even too pleasing, too kind of, you know, erratic, then we're reacting to something. So being able to hold space. So that's one of the main qualities you see in anyone who's done serious work is that they hold space very well. So if someone's asked a difficult question, they don't just reject it. They hold space for mm-hmm. a while mm-hmm. and, and then they'll respond to it. So that's the first one. The second, and these two go together, and the second main quality is unfailingly generous, unfailingly kind. Not 95%, not 97.3%, 100%. Now, there are times where someone may be dynamic and getting a bit of righteous anger when it comes to someone being rude and horrible and you say, stop doing that. But behind it has always got to be some measure of generosity and kindness. And if those two things aren't there, then, well, we've got work to do. <laughs> and so... Yeah. These are the two main principles. So so if you can hold that's space the, for your group. And that's the awareness stage or is that the enlightened stage? Because that's a very, well, obviously that, that's, that's, all, a, that's different. That's, all, that's all enlightenment about, is. It? It's just increasing, right. increasing levels of consistency with both generosity and spaciousness. That's it. So is that in line with the Yoga Sutras or how do you? Oh, yeah, how do you, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Right, okay. Stiram sukham asanam. I mean, you can, you can basically look at yoga is the absence of a polarity. It's the absence of when we have friction between inhalation and exhalation. It's not doing inhale or exhale. It's when they, they no longer matter. It's when you're so calm that the mind and the system is quiet. And when you're quiet, you, you, you feel love. When you're quiet, you feel open to whatever comes your way. You feel quite capable of dealing with someone who... You can deal with someone else who's quiet. That's quite easy. You can deal with someone else who's crying. You can deal with someone else who's yelling at you saying, I hate you. I mean, it's, that's going to be very uncomfortable, but at least you can mm-hmm. say, oh, okay, well, I hear that you hate me. <laughs> like if you, respond, if you respond like that, it's very different than saying, well, fuck you, buddy. <laughs> yeah. So, you, I mean, you mentioned you were an asthma teacher. and Do you see yourself as a yoga teacher at all? Oh, no, absolutely. Teach, yes, I teach, yes, you're teaching more you than know, just the physical system. You're trying and how, and how do you do that? Right, okay. It's just that the, the entry point is the physical system. And so that means my ethical entry point has to be taking care of the body. Now, if your entry point is doing kundalini and the energy system, then your yeah. entry point, ethically speaking, is to take care of the energy system. And, and ethically, I would say upwards of 50% of Kundalini teachers, probably more, don't do that because it, it comes with some responsibility. For example, because you mentioned Kundalini, you have 10 new students come to your class. Let's say you've got 20 students, 10 of them are new. Those 10 students, you've got to ask two questions. Number one, are you on medication? Number two, have you done any breath work before? All right, or number two could be... Uh, well, you know, but so number one, medication, and along with medication would then go, are you seeing a therapist? And if a person is on medication and it's antidepressants or anything like that, you say, I'm sorry, you can't do this class. Mm. All right? If someone comes along and um, high, particularly extreme high or low blood pressure as a kundalini teacher, you don't ask that question. No, you can't do this class. You are high risk. Now, most kundalini teachers don't ask the question in the first place. Now, just like an asana teacher, someone comes in and they come in in crutches. I want to do your Ashtanga class. You're like, well, and you can see the cast on their leg. You say, I don't think this is going to work. I mean, it's obvious because you can see it. 
I mean, that's a, that's not unlikely to happen. But you know, I, I mean, I had, I had a guy come in with a, a knee in bandage, and he says, "I want to do a yoga class." I'm like, "What happened to your knee?" Oh, I heard it. You know, the doctor says it might be the meniscus. I said, "I'm sorry, you. No, you, this class is not. I can't." It's not appropriate for you to do this class. Like I could teach you a private and then we could do different things, but Mm -mm. a group class like this, it's not going to work. So the problem is some of those questions. And so if you're teaching a a meditation system, it it might be different, but you get someone coming in and say, okay, have you ever sat still before? No, never. Okay. Well, you can try, but it's likely to be difficult. And so, you know, it's just simple questions that any system, different questions you would ask for different systems to just have a sense of, well, is this going to work for this person or not? So how do you, I mean, can you convey something deeper than the asthma in your teaching? Or are you oh, doing that so. with the person? Right. Well, okay. So the, the, how I, one of the reasons I stopped teaching general classes and stopped teaching weekend workshops was because most of that was physical and became a little dissatisfying. I, you know, I love right. doing pranayama and meditation practice, so I want to teach them. I mean, there are four four main areas of yoga, one of which isn't particularly traditional. But uh, So the four, f- the four areas are asana and all the things that go with that, combination of well, breath, that could be energy work too, but asana, you know, alignment, structure, taking care of the body, you know, progressive sequencing, blah, 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 blah. Then you would have sort of various energy work, so breathing, pranayama, it could be visualisation, chakra, like there's different ways to play with energy. Um, Then we would have various forms of interpersonal communication and psychotherapy. Now that's one that if you're a traditionalist in yoga, you know, you're not going to do and sadly you'll miss out. And that's part of yoga in your mind. I mean, I know you're interested in psychotherapy. Absolutely. If if you're a teacher... And don't have a handle on psychotherapy, well, <laughs> you, you, you know, even if it's just looking at stuff on YouTube and reading about it, you know, you, understanding and enacting, you know, actually good yeah. sort of every every yoga teacher, well, like every doctor should be doing some, ba- I mean, all doctors have to, should be doing some basic psychotherapy. And I've met well, some doctors, be- mind you who are horrible in terms of, because they, you see well, them for five minutes and then you're out. And so they have very, very horrible, what do they call that? A bedside manner, bedside, you know, they're not yeah, very good I mean, at talking you, yeah. to people. If you look at the context that yoga is often situated within, it's very much um, the, the kind of, let's say the quietest, the, the retreat from society rather than the involvement more in interpersonal relationships, right? It can easily, yoga can easily kind of, you know, well, the, kind of, well, it depends on matter. what yoga you're talking about. Because if, if, you, right. if you're talking about c- classical, it's really neo-Raja yoga, which would be more yoga as the renunciate, then sure, that's... But see, that's an escape. See, half the time... I mean, I've talked to a lot of monks. Half the time, monks may be very good at meditating, but really lousy at their interpersonal relationships. Not all. Some of them are quite... develop those skills naturally, but... It requires an, an extra bit of work. And there's stuff that's, that, if you look at the... That, that's yeah, part of yoga. You, you, you need that. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, we're human beings. What, you know, the, what do you, you know, food, shelter, water, and company. Are those the four things? That's something like that. Um, you know, if we, don't, if we don't try and work on our communication skills, and if you're teaching yoga, I mean, my God, words have got to come out of your mouth to instruct someone to do something with their body. That's communication. And even if, no matter how crazy you are thinking that that's purely a structural piece of advice that you're giving, if that's your only lens with which to view it, you're never going to be able to see what's really going on. You have to be able to read people, their mood, how they're feeling, and that's going to influence how you teach them. It should. You know, they're changing personality because, you know, one day a student comes in and they're all happy and jumping around and excited to practice and the next day they come in and they're sad and gloomy and you don't necessarily have to ask them what that's about but you've got to be tuned in enough to know how to take, you know, a little bit to be respectful and take care of that. And so that's basic interpersonal skills. Most teacher trainings and most yoga teachers don't do, I don't know, I don't think they do a lot of work on this. 
I think some teachers end up, I think some teachers end up studying it through mm. just mm. teaching themselves and are open enough to be considerate enough to, to, to the students to, to learn but, organically. Yeah. But it's, it's still it seems, a, a, an important piece. It seems like your model kind of inherently involves some element of conflict between the, in the, in the learning process or, you know, the kind of attempt at resolving or, or engaging yeah. with that conflict. Right. 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 It, to, to, to assume that you're going to teach yoga and you're never going to have conflict is, well, an accident waiting to happen. And so conflict, conflict occurs as soon as we are born. We're born in conflict. It's a part of dealing with the environment. The environment does not have your best interests at heart, no matter what you think about it. The environment is harsh, it is aggressive, and it is threatening. And, 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 and dealing with a threatening environment and I'm not saying this to be negative. I'm saying this is a reality. W- what we have to do is, is do our best to open up to it versus constantly control it. And so, I mean, there are certain parts of environment we need to control. So like your bedroom, it's good if you can keep it neat and tidy so that you don't have so many dust and germs and bugs and, you know, you, you'll sleep better if your bed is neatly made. I mean, so there's a certain amount of control that you do with that just as when right. you practice there's a certain amount of control with your breath, with alignment, yada, yada, yada. When you teach, there's a certain mm. amount of control with how you pace what you're saying, how you deal with students. So you have to be controlling. And it's not either or, it's and you also have to be considerate and flexible and mindful of someone else's feelings. And so it, it, it's, a, it's a matter of developing all those skills versus just one of them. So someone might start because you have that tendency. Maybe you start with learning good structural anatomy and physiology with the asana. But if that's all you do, you're probably going to be a lousy communicator and you're not going to feel what other people feel. If you also happen to develop some good psychotherapy tools, then you'll be much more likely to not only be good with the structural therapy stuff, but also be able to sense when someone is struggling and then help them with it. And it doesn't mean you have a necessarily, it doesn't mean you turn into a psychotherapist. It just means that you can just be considerate enough to, oh, uh, you know, are you okay? Do you, do you, and so maybe you need to change your practice or you, do, you just do this differently. And then they're like, oh, God, I'm so glad you told me that today. I was so struggling. It was so, you know, so mm, good that mm, I, because mm. I didn't see it but, myself and that was wonderful, you know, and so the general feedback you get from that kind of thing is fantastic. And then at other times, someone else has come in for the third week running and they're just flopping around on your mat and you say, you know what, I'm not sure why you're here. I think you should start, you know, putting a bit of of work in. I think you should just get your ass into gear. This is me giving you a kick up the bum, start working. You would say that to them? Yes. Right. Well, yeah, you're going to get into conflict there, aren't you? You, know, you, better, now, you better have done your psychotherapy well, right. work. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, no, I think disagreement and friction are good things. Right, okay, there, are times, okay. mm-hmm. there are times when you want to consciously choose that and you say, look, right now I'm right. going to tell you something. I don't know if you want to hear it, but this is what I'm experiencing. And you might, I might start with, I'm finding this very difficult to teach you because all I feel is you don't want to, you don't want to pay attention. And that right. makes it, make my job very difficult and I feel like I don't even want to look at you. And a student hears that and they're like, oh, really? I said, yeah, because you're, you're all over the place. It doesn't, I don't want to blame you. you. That's what you may need right now, but it makes my job very difficult. Yeah, so can yeah. you try and just a little bit pick up your focus? Right. Now, I don't, I very rarely say those things. I'm much, yeah. I'm very rare. No, I mean, really. It's going to be a lot of hard work well. teaching. Yeah, if you, if, yeah, I mean, no, you, it takes, it, it yeah, takes a quite a difficult student. Yeah, it takes yeah. quite a difficult student before I'll say, look, I'm, I'm really struggling. You know, I, I don't feel like, and what's interesting is every now and then with those kinds of students, it's usually because it's someone I don't know. They may, see, I teach one month courses. And so the benefit of those, this is back to your early point, is that yeah. I have a captive audience for a month. They do two classes a day. And in those two classes, I cover meditation and pranayama and philosophy, asana yeah. technique, mm. some strength work, blah, blah, blah. And they start implementing all of that over that whole month. And so by the end, they've got a good chance of continuing that, even just a little bit in self-practice when they get home. And so I'm, I'm giving people at least a few tools to yeah, continue, yeah. Pr- I, continue practicing. 
I've got just enough time on this format. Um, let, let's go and just quickly say about what, or ask you about what you think about pranayama and meditation. How does that look for you? How do you, how do you teach that? How do you start to teach that? How does it evolve from asana? Yeah, I, I've, over the last, I guess it's 15 years or so now, I've mm. developed my own pranayama system. It's not, it's pulling some elements from some of the different traditions, but I've kind of codified it in a way that it, it links with meditation practice, it links back to the asana practice. It's, it's basically, there's a couple of key elements in it, but the main one is uh, pranayama. If, if you look at the breath as three principal elements, we've got inhalation, exhalation, and the pause that lies between them. So that, that, those are three elements. And the fourth element is how you combine them. Most of the time when people start learning any kind of pranayama, they get a little too quickly into either Nadi Shodhana, which is a very nice pranayama to learn, and, but, and Kumbhaka, which is, although nice to learn, at the beginning, I would say five years or so of practice, is a, a horrible mistake. Right? Because if someone doesn't know how to breathe organically first without tension, adding Kumbhaka is going to just not teach them the right thing. So the first tool to learn is can I do, let's say, a 10-second inhalation, pause for two to three seconds at the end of it comfortably, not not holding, not locking, just a natural effortless pause, which is neither inhalation nor exhalation. It's called stumba. Patanjali mentions this. It's it's a little Mm. key key thing in his sutra, right? And then at the end of the exhalation, 10 seconds also, pause for another two to three seconds comfortably. Mm-hmm. and maintain that for 20 to 30 breaths until you reach that point, any other pranayama is entertainment and pulling you away from good physiological breathing. Now, within that, the 10-second inhalation, two, three-second pause and, and so on, we may need to look at is someone, you know, high-low blood pressure, uh, asthmatic, um, uh, narrow rib cage, you know, v- various structures where they're breathing you know, too much into the front ribs, not enough into the back ribs, things like that that may need to be addressed. There's various techniques that we would introduce to try and help someone in different ways, you know, like breathing with your back against the wall or even lying down with your legs up the wall and breathing. So various ways to be comfortable so that you can work from a two-second breath to a five or seven or ten-second breath and just very comfortably. And so being able to breathe without tension. And so one of the first things most students do when they're introduced in a vinyasa class without learning a little bit of pranayama is they do a salute to the sun. This is, say, an ashtanga or a vinyasa class. They inhale, hold the breath, exhale, hold the breath, inhale, hold the breath, Mm -hmm. exhale, hold the breath for anywhere up to an hour and a half to two hours. And then they repeat that every class and they develop the habit of unconsciously applying tension at the end of every breath. And if you keep learning that, you you are going to get injured. And I don't mm, care how mm. good a, an alignment teacher or how good mm, you are mm. at bending or being strong, if you keep holding your breath, you will hurt. And so you'll probably pop your hamstring or you'll bung your knee or any number of things mm, will go wrong. Mm, mm. Whereas if you inhale, pause, soft, exhale, pause, soft, and you can do that for two hours, including things like jumps, upward dog and back bending, mm-hmm. or, or headstand, for example. A lot of people do 30 breaths in headstand, but they're uh, squeezing their jaw together. So if you can yeah. do, if you can do, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I teach this in a lot of classes. I, I just get people, I'll, I'll, you know, you do a long vinyasa class and you just do 10 breaths in headstand, but I count every, all of those 10 breaths for a count of five with a two-second pause. And by the end of that class, there's one person left because almost nobody can maintain the whole class and do just 10 breaths in headstand. It's very interesting. Some people can, but a lot of people, because they're not used to breathing without tension. So this is pranayama. And it comes back to what we do in asana. So that was, that was my first point. Yep. And then it lends itself to meditation. Yep. So okay. yep. inhalation is something. We know what it is because we feel it. We're breathing in, oxygen is going into the lungs. Breathing out is something. Yeah. Right? Oxygen is coming out. Right, I'm breathing out. I can feel it. Uh-huh. Right. Yep. The pause is not something. 
If there is something happening when the pause is happening, that's not the pause yet. And that doesn't matter whether it's physical or psychological, a uh, thought. Right? A thought interrupts the pause. It isn't, a thought isn't the pause. The pause is the absence. This is what points us directly to meditation. So you start getting used to doing these pranayama practices. Even within your asana, it starts there. You're meditating, not while you're doing something, but when you start to witness as nothing. And so and the, that, pause, the pause is meditation? Yes. Your consciousness as awareness is the pause. The pause is your consciousness. They are not separate. They are functionally not to and you're, advise. And you're experiencing, and the pause is something or nothing? It's, it's not something. It's not something. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying it's nothing. I'm saying it's not something. Right. <laughs> right. Is there further, I mean, do you teach further techniques or is that the meditation yes. technique that you're teaching? No. Right. Oh, well, that's, that's the essence of it. I mean, okay. you, I mean, if you want to start with a simpler meditation, it's just do pranayama. You just, you just breathe deeply and then keep following your breath. Allow your breath yep. to get softer and softer. Keep following uh, your breath and just let, let yourself be more quiet more soft, but, but stay awake. You know, the two tendencies with meditation, and there's really only two at the beginning, is number one, you fall asleep, or yeah. number two, your mind gets so busy you get agitated. And you have to work through both of those. And if, some people have a strong tendency for one or the other, or you go through both in cycles. And by getting used to sitting still, and it doesn't really matter what the technique is, you can practice any sitting technique and, and you just have to work through those kind of uh, sets of conditioning because the mind, when it gets tired, either falls asleep and drags you with it or doesn't like not existing and so it gets busy and starts thinking about something. And it drags you either into sleepiness or drags you into thinking obsessively. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And there's a, a gap, uh, a pause, a stumble between those two. And you've got to be vigilant about looking for that gap. And that, in that gap, we have peace, we have kindness, we have love, we have generosity. Because it's not based on getting anything, it's not based on doing anything, it's based on, on simple spaciousness, the awareness of what is and accepting the experience of what is. Matthew, I knew you can talk, um, mm. and you, you can talk. Um, I'm going to have to wrap it up with you now, I can't give you more time okay. than everyone else, but I'd like to. I'm going to give you another one at some point if you'd like to do it. What advice okay. could you give to your younger self? Now, just to end on a couple of fun questions, what, what advice could you give to the 20-year-old Matthew Sweeney on the Chimundi Hill with the red shorts? It's a good one, isn't it? <laughs> There's so many things I'd like to say to my younger self. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it would just be around... No, don't be so worried about what other people think. Right. Uh, that wouldn't apply to everyone. It just would have applied to my younger self. Don't be, don't be inconsiderate, but just don't be too worried about what other people think. Do, do, do what's good. And what, um, um, another question, a separate question, what inspires you? A person, a place, uh, a subject? Um, well, the beach. <laughs> any, any beach as long as it doesn't have a lot of rubbish on it. The, the beach, the ocean, and uh, I guess not, fun yoga conversations like this. Do you surf? No, I, I like being in the ocean, not on it. Oh, right, okay, right. You don't surf, you're Australian. You're going to be yeah, no. I, I, yeah. I don't drink. I don't drink beer and I don't watch football, so I'm very Oh, right, wow, wow. Well, you, you may as well, yeah, well, you left anyway, so... Lucky, yeah. you're gonna be so disowned. Um, do you, yeah, that's uh, right. do you have any? <laughs> do you have any tips for diet at all? Yes, like a lot of people. There's two things I would say about diet. One, be very wary of diet that is cultural. So if you've grown up English, watch out for things that are atypical of that culture because it we, we get kind of conditioned about right or wrong yeah. in that. Right. If you've, or if you've, or you adopt another cultural diet. So let's say I'm Australian, and then I go to India, and then oh, it's all about Ayurveda and eating. That's a mm-hmm. cultural diet, and as as a result, it's it's highly limited. So all diets have a either a basis in culture or a basis in limitation. And so I do think 
heading towards more plant-based. I don't think eating meat is fundamentally bad. It's not entirely ethical, but I don't think it's fundamentally bad. But I think it's better for the animal if you don't. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> um, like but plant-based and just mm. just eating eating as much fresh food as you can. Like I think variety is good. But, I, but I, I think it's good to be wary of like the golden pill when it comes to those systems because there's a lot of often new fad diets and so on. I think it's just like even things like fasting twice a year or three times a year, I don't think that's particularly healthy, particularly if you're right. a, a fairly thin body type already. You know, I just think you're better off fasting for the whole year, i.e. just eating consistently, regularly and trying to avoid processed food. Stop eating so much refined sugar and fat and sticky donuts and all that business and, and just, you know, good food that comes from the ground. Mm. Well, it's been wonderful to have you. Um, where can people find you? Uh, well, yogatemple.com and you can look at my courses. Uh, if, if I ever get back to Bali, come and do a course in Bali. <laughs> I'm going to come and visit you. Um, well, yeah, thanks very much, Matt, um, for thank coming you. on the show. Um, it's been lovely right, to talk to you. Thanks, Adam. 